some level of width before. I'd like to talk about kind of where we are right now, uh, some of the issues that, uh, as we go forward, and also to try to give you a timeline of some of the things that have to happen in the next month and a half, uh, two months, and uh, some of the plans that are on that. And again, I'll try to uh, go through the material that you've seen uh, just to give context so that we can uh, get to some of the different issues, and then I'd certainly like to uh, be able to, uh, uh, to open for questions and some discussion. Um, you all have a copy, I believe, uh, this is going to come around and we'll also put it on the screen as it comes up here. So I guess the copy is really good. Uh, and hopefully it's coming up here uh, shortly. So uh, just uh, what, what we'd like to do then again uh, is to give you some context of what happened, where we are in terms of our own investigations, and uh, there are many, many different threads of inquiry going on in terms of consequences and uh, long-term stand up of uh, WIP again in the future and uh, what it means for everything from uh, handling of transuranic waste as well as alcohols to transportation uh, across uh, uh, the roads within New Mexico to, uh, to get to WIP. Um, I think that as we learned here to see this, we're going to hand out some of these. It's maybe a little easier just to, uh, to go to the, uh, the actual view graphs as uh, we try to get it uh, projected on the screen. I want to remind you that uh, WIP has been in operation for about 15 years. And in that period of time, they received waste from uh, a number of generator sites, but particularly three generator sites. And that uh, generator sites are, of course, Los Alamos, Idaho, and Savannah River. And so that's the majority of the waste that comes to uh, WIP to be deposited in this uh, underground salt bed that are about 2,000 feet below the surface. And the idea there is that uh, uh, they'll close a the panel after a certain amount of waste is put in, and the salt, or the rheology of the salt, the strength of the salt will be said to eventually collapse on that waste and hold that waste uh, for a period of time to hundreds of thousands of years. And uh, that's the intent of what was uh, of the repository. The repository had two events uh, that occurred. The first was there was an underground fire on February 5th. So a salt burn, they're doing an active mining operation, uh, caught fire. And uh, that's, that particular incident has already been investigated. And uh, DOE has issued what's called an accident incident uh, board investigation of that. And, uh, has, and as you know, a uh, number of issues have uh, been highlighted in terms of lack of maintenance and so on associated with that, uh, which are presently being addressed. Uh, roughly nine days later, there was a radiological release underground that was reported. Um, again, this radiological release uh, eventually was uh, uh, determined to come from a particular panel which weighs the sport and a visual inspection along with analysis of what's done in the filters to capture all the material that comes out of the mine uh, concluded that that was a breach of the Los Alamos drum. And uh, that Los Alamos drum, um, which uh, we know by a number, 68660, very similar to the sign of the devil, um, we basically uh, continue to try to understand exactly what was the set of reactions that occurred within that so that we can not only assure we have a safe and uh, secure um, association with all the wet barrels but also a path forward to remediate anything in the future. So to remind you, transuranic waste, uh, it's an easy word to say, but what it is is pretty complicated. So in fact, it's any waste that's uh, generated in weapons work that has a contamination from a certain set of elements or attachments. Basically anything from uranium on up, so what we call the transuranics. And so you would expect those to be generated, uh, particularly in weapons work, but they're also generated uh, in work in what we call advanced radiation. It's also occasionally generated in reactors for the military. And uh, Los Alamos had transuranic waste uh, in its package. The great bulk of the volume of that waste is things like lugs, paper, uh, insides of lug boxes, glass, all these kinds of things. And so um, that waste is uh, packaged and eventually we move to storage. The slide there shows you what looks like the inside of the actual uh, processing facility. Again, I think that uh, a visual of what transuranic waste is, it's very heterogeneous, it's fresh. How do you have to package this in a, and to really understand what's in there is a big issue. Uh, the next slide, um, again, just 
summarize the timeline, which I just went through. I'm going to come back to this, so I'm going to skip this so we have time to uh, some discussion. The next slide is a picture inside panel 7, room 7. And uh, what you see is a visual inspection. You start down there in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, you can see a, a picture back into this panel. And this is typically what you see as you fill up a panel. What you see there are bundles of waste. Uh, the one bundle of waste you see on the right-hand side looks like a cellophane wrap. That's Los Alamos waste. We package our waste in 55 barrel uh, gallon barrels, and we ship them seven at a time in a month. Um, you can see that there's some other oblong uh, containers, what are called standard waste containers, and those are on the left-hand side. Those are waste packages from Idaho. So they're commingled within this panel. On top of this panel, then there's some bags of material. These bags of material are magnesium oxide. The intent of those bags is that so the long-term viability of the uh, whip is will uh, keep any of the radioactive nucleus, in particular plutonium, from moving. And they interact as the salt squeeze down, the barrels eventually go away uh, tens of thousands of years from now. That material that's in those bags will immobilize any plutonium. You can see on the upper right-hand corner is a picture that was taken that shows the breach. Um, what you see there is a 55 gallon drum was originally white. It's now black, telling you that uh, for a period of time it was uh, exposed to very high temperatures. Um, those high temperatures, on the basis of looking at all the other drums, were over a very short period of time. Nevertheless, to change that color of drum, the temperatures were high on the order of 300 to 500 degrees C. That's pretty high. And you can see the small lip of the drum is is uh, pushed up, and that's where the breach occurred. You see white powder around there. That's the magnesium oxide that was originally put in for a different purpose. It's hot enough that the bags that contain that melted, and you can see that it's distributed around, so there's a little bit of a pressure force that came out of this. Uh, next slide. So how did we get there? What does it look like, and so what are we doing? Uh, I want to give you kind of a simplified version of how we trans uh, work on transuranic waste. You'll see in a moment for 68660, it was transuranic waste that was generated in 1985. It was stored at Los Alamos uh, for roughly 30 years, 29 years, before it got packaged. When we do this, uh, this waste had been stored above ground after the uh, fire in 2011. It became an urgent need driven by getting these kinds of waste off the hill and into a repository because of wildfire season that we entered a uh, agreement with the state of New Mexico uh, to remove that waste, that campaign became to remove that waste, it's called 3706, kind of a strange name, it tells you the number of cubic meters of waste that has to be removed, so that's where that name comes from. And uh, to do that, then we take this, uh, you see both uh, on that transuranic waste diagram over on the left hand side, it comes across, we go ahead and sort and segregate it, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, um, we make sure everything is uh, compliant uh, with a particular set of uh, conditions. It's a complicated process, so when it's over on the far left-hand side, it's owned by NNSA. When it's on the far right-hand side, it's owned by Environmental Management, DOE. They are not the same organization. So that requires a number of handshakes, both from a legal perspective and a requirements perspective. In addition, as we do that and move across, we interact with the uh, oversight of actual all the chemistry that's there. That's the New Mexico Environmental Department. So they own what's known as the RICRA requirements, which is the de-evolution uh, de of federal requirements to the states. In addition, um, as it moves it out across here, it's transported across the roads, which means the Department of Transportation also certifies uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. If I go to the next slide, um, I just want to again to go through this. What's the waste? We generate this waste in what's known as TN55. It goes to what's known as the Wicker facility where it's processed. You can see that uh, one of these drums is now being dumped out. All the waste that was stored above ground is repackaged every time. So we have a language called parent drums and sibling drums. And the parent drums are those which we have stored uh, for this period of time, in this case, 30 years. The sibling drums are when we repackage. In general, when we repackage, the ratio is something like 2 to 1 to 5 to 1, depending on both the activity and anything else that's in there that you want to immobilize. 
Um, once that's done, it's put in area G, and then we package that, and you can see down in the lower right-hand corner, it's packaged through a transuranic waste or a true pack, and that true pack is a polar pack condition such that uh, you not only have the integrity associated with the barrels, you have something that uh, stores that waste as it's moved across uh, to withstand uh, both collision insult or another environmental insult. So just to, to uh, highlight the next slide, for 68660, this waste was originally generated by reprocessing plutonium scrap that came from Rocky Flats between the period of 1979 and 1985. Um, when it comes to re reprocessing the scrap, that metal plutonium is retrieved through a process which we call nitrization and then evaporation. And so uh, we can recover it with a uh, high purity, but to do that, acids are used, and therefore they make salts when we evaporate it out. Those salts are known as nitric salts. And uh, it's the primary part of what that waste then is these nitric salts, and something that we've always been concerned about, uh, the potential reactivity. So once it's uh, put there, you can see as you go down to the bottom, uh, two daughter drums came out of the original package that contained this. Once we put this material through, repackage it, we check it for the total amount of radioactivity dose. We also take x-rays of it. So we need to know what's in that drug. So there's nothing that's uh, prohibited. For example, you don't want to store underground liquid. You don't want to store ground something like a pressurized can. You wouldn't want uh, a can that's totally pressurized. And so all those items are called prohibited items to look at. And that drum was then packaged, you see, on December. 2013. So it was then transported to WIP and put underground on the 31st of January 2014, and the radiological release that was reported was two weeks later. So it's a relatively small period of time, which turns out to be very important for us to understand uh, what, what happened. So I want to kind of go over the actions that we're looking at as we go through this. Um, when there was a radiological release, uh, we suspended any shipment, of course, including uh, processing of this. We took all the uh, remaining waste that was associated with 3706 and we isolated it. We isolated it by overpacking it in what's known as uh, uh, standard waste containers. They're shown up on the upper right hand side here. There's three empty barrels and one barrel there. The intent there is to be able to put it in a configuration which we can monitor trying to understand what's happening, and at the same time, overpacking it so that any uh, action that's there will be fully contained. Um, we respond to the New Mexico Environmental Department's administrative order associated with this, and of course then there became a DOE-wide accident uh, incident board. Um, I was designated uh, to come over and be part of the WIP recovery team with uh, a couple things uh, in mind. First and foremost, understanding the details of what happened. Why did it happen? And as I'll show you in a minute, there's a science piece to that, there's also a process piece to that. We need to know exactly why it happened, so that we not only sure it doesn't happen in the future, but that we have a safe configuration today. Um, and our goal then is ultimately uh, to finish the campaign associated with 3706. We're 93% done, uh, so we're almost done with this campaign when it occurs with this. Original driver to get that above ground waste off uh, Los Alamos and safely underground uh, remains. Um, the next slide uh, is a science slide, which I won't spend a lot of time on. But what I'll tell you is what we know now is that uh, this heterogeneous waste has the potential for numerous reactions. We call these stepwise reactions. So when a reaction occurs, what you do is produce heat. And that heat allows other reactions to occur if you produce enough heat. A simple way to think about this is anything will burn if you get it hot enough. <coughs> During the World Trade Center uh, attack, uh, the buildings came down not because of the airplane collision, but because the fire within the building eventually got hot enough to burn the paper that was contained within the file cabinets. And that allowed that extra reaction to reach temperatures of 1200 to 1300 degrees C. We worry about the same kinds of things in drums. Can you have a series of reactions? Any one of them 
would not have caused this, but in aggregate, we could reach a condition in which we have some breach. And that's uh, the focus of where we are today. We believe we understand that, and I will say we understand it to uh, a high degree, but um, there is still a little uncertainty in how you begin to initiate this. So, what we've done is we've identified a certain set of conditions which are nearly unique to 68660. These nearly unique conditions occur uh, in the following things. It was in the nitrate waste stream. The nitrate waste stream, we always mix it with a desiccant, something to make sure no liquids are there. In this case, it was an organic desiccant, the so-called kitty lid. That's still a natural uh, organic material which can react with certain kinds of acids, in particular nitric acids. We then so looked and saw we had nitric acids that come from this. Our set number of barrels uh, that originally were stored 55 had bags of nitric acid. Uh, the normal process with was open this nitric acid and neutralize it. But um, the records are handwritten on whether it was neutralized or not. And there's a reason you neutralize it to make sure it's not corrosive, but um, we can say with certainty that some of them were fully neutralized or neutralized. Or I don't have the confidence to do that. We also looked at the presence of other metals, in particular lead. We know from um, uh, 60 year of experience with handling these kinds of materials all across the US and in other countries that lead can interact with nitric acid. And finally, uh, when we look at this, all these things together, uh, what would be the things that could potentially uh, go together for a step one? Any one of these reactions, um, as I said, can't produce enough heat alone. But if we put them all together, potentially could do that. So what we identified was 16 drums in which the conditions may or may not look like 68660, but are enough of a concern that we have special monitoring and special uh, focus on. Those 16 include the breach drum. And uh, we continue to look at what we need to do with those. We've developed a series of strategies for what we call safety. How can we assure, even if those barrels are from to go, that uh, they will never go? They'll be inert so that we can move to the next phase in which we repackage those barrels such that they're in cement or something else in which can't be reacted. And so that's the stage we're uh, working on in terms of where we're at in Los Alamos. Um, the next slide here is the slide about how could this possibly happen. A very complicated process to do this. Uh, what we have is uh, looking at all the roles and responsibilities. This waste part of the laboratory is a big part of the laboratory. It also is managed uh, with large number of subcontractors. Was there appropriate set of roles and responsibilities? Does procedures work there? Uh, have we complied with all orders, regulations, policies, the consent order? Did our practices match our procedures? And are we really managing this as well? And the obvious answer in the last one, by the way, is no. And so we're working through those issues to understand how that could have happened. So uh, I want to just kind of leave uh, with our priorities today and where we're at and open up. Uh, first is that uh, we really, uh, I believe, close to determining what happened, but we want to ensure the entire true waste stream is safe. We want to help restore WIP to its uh, uh, process. But most importantly in all of these is the last one, and it's to protect the public and the environment so that we can assure that we don't have anything like this uh, occur in the future. And we have conditions which uh, over, uh, overcome what we would look at as normal or conventional classes to do that. So today, uh, WIP has stood down, and uh, the prospects of WIP standing up um, mean it has to go through a uh, recertification process. We have to uh, invest there to put in a new uh, ventilation system. That would have happened irrespective of this. And at the same time, assure they have processes and procedures on all these handoffs uh, that go forward. So I'm, um, I don't know if, if the Mexico Environmental Department wants to speak first before we uh, we open the questions, or? Uh, I think the question is for Mr. Wallace might be appropriate at this time.
That's a really good question. Um, so um, there has been sampling done under underground, uh, but not within the drum itself. And so um, we're not involved in the actual sampling itself. There is a technical systems team associated with uh, 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 other parts of DOE, so that we're not part of that necessarily. And all the experiments that we've done are done at Los Alamos <coughs> and light drums for the parent drum, which is empty. Um, so we have not actually sampled with um, we've done roughly 3,000 experiments, 500 of those experiments are kind of unique sets we have to reproduce. We've got about 300 scientists that are working on this particular project, uh, all of the different levels of expertise, whether it be explosives or what we call catalysis chemistry, understanding these kinds of things. But nobody's actually put something in the barrel itself. Uh, I'm not sure that you really have to do that. We know pretty well from the pedigree what must have been in there, and I'm not sure we would learn exactly what those series of reactions would be at these series of stepwise <coughs> to be able to do this. But we will continue to do that. Uh, there's an entry into it this week, uh, the date associated with that, mainly with the photography, but they'll be taking more samples. Chair, just to follow up, Mr. Wallace, um, the daughter drums that were packaged located those and have you been monitoring those? What's your plan for so, the excellent, excellent question and uh, I kind of uh, lost over that. All what this waste stream and of course when we start to speak about waste streams and DOE and everything else we have to have initials to describe it. This is called the minnow 2 waste stream for the nitrogen salt. We know where every one of those barrels are. We know where every one of the barrels that have the liquid that we had to neutralize the ones I told you. Uh, and what we put them all in a case in which Remember, most are already underground. But all those that have been processed, we've uh, identified. We do regular monitoring on them. What we do is look for temperature recordings. So these reactions cause a temperature increase. And we can measure temperature very accurately. And if we see the temperature increasing, we know eventually that they may have a series of reactions which would cause us concern. So we have emergency responses to be able to respond, respond to those kinds of things. We also look at these drums all have a vent on them so that you don't build up gases. And so we daily monitor the, what's going on in the 